the difficulty of people coming in and listening, like last week was a very intense message, lots of historical information, which should be not designed for you to remember it all, but it should be mind-boggling that that much detail of history is in the 11th chapter of Daniel. It's mind-boggling. And I've told you, some of you go check out what I said because it may vary or differ a little bit from the things you've previously heard. I don't care. I've done my homework, and I've said, go and check it out. It's not something, you know, um, some of the better sources that have historical information will be in complete alignment with what I've said on the historical matters. But you have people that come into the church every single Sunday who listen, and they bring their baggage of what the church ought to be. And part of that great issue is that along with that baggage, there's something else. And let's just say a guest in their suitcase. How's that? And, and the guest is traditions that make void the word of God. And they like to take their traditions. I know I was part of that group of people that came in the church that was just stunned, amazed, and angered all at the same time when I heard the late Dr. Scott preaching on subjects and things that were, they were my sacred cows. How could anybody touch that? But the Lord opened up my heart and my mind to be able to sit and after a period of uh, eyebrow raising and having to go check it out myself, I realized that this was true. Now, I'm praying each time people come into the church that God has opened up your heart and your mind, that even if you have come out of a different theological background, be open-minded enough. It's the ignorant people that say it's, it can only be this, and they come in with blinders, and God cannot, God can open up those eyes, but it's very difficult when you come in with this kind of vigorous, I will not, I shall not be moved out of what I have known. And the problem is most of those people who are that dogmatic usually do not have a very good grasp of the Bible, let alone the original languages. So you open up several layers of problems. So that's my challenge. Um, there are preconceived notions even about prophecy and a lack of complete biblical a gestalt, if you will, um, lends usually to error or people rejecting something because it's so far out there. I was talking with somebody last week or a week and a half ago about uh, the devil and demonic power. And, of course, this is coming from someone who's not very strong in the faith, and they said, you do believe this? And I thought, well, okay, how do, how do you approach somebody who doesn't, who's asking me if I believe this when the whole, the whole book is hinged upon three, two and a half or three chapters of God's perfect creation? Well, let's just say the gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 that talks about the recreation, the creation of what is now the earth, and man, Adam and Eve, and the rest of the chapters after the third chapter tell of the unfolding drama of redemption and Satan's, boy, his plan to thwart and corrupt at every juncture, at every intersection. And failure to understand that is a setup to fail to understand prophetic revelation in its entirety. Let me explain a little bit. You don't have to go too far to the book of Genesis. If you follow the line of thinking that the earth was so corrupt by the time of Noah that God had to send a flood, and Noah, build an ark. Now, talk about absolute faith to build an ark for something that had never essentially been seen before. But in obedience to God's word and listening attentively, builds the ark he and his sons and their wives, who, let's not even talk about that, board the love boat, <laughs> the biblical love boat, with clean and unclean animals that God said, this is what I want, and so he did. And God essentially starts over with this first family, but there was already evil in the heart of man, so no amount of cleansing the earth itself 
could eradicate the problem. And all you need to do is, after the flood, realize it's just, in our Bible, it's just a few chapters later that we have those people coming out of the line of Nimrod, that is the cursed line, that is the precursor to all the false religions, building the Tower of Babel. They were going to build a tower up to God. Think about it, because God has a way of balancing all things out in his, in his book. I always said the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament was man's way to try and ascend, just like the spirit of Satan that we read about in Ezekiel and Isaiah, to ascend to God's heights. And it took the coming of Christ, the death and resurrection, virgin birth, death, resurrection, in that short order, if you will, of Jesus Christ, to then reverse the scattering of the tongues, that the day of Pentecost, the Spirit could be poured out from heaven upon men to essentially bring something to a close, if you will, instead of confounding the tongues they all understood. But in the prophetic revelation, you've got a series of false religions that creep in. Um, I think even when we get to the point of understanding, even though God prophesied to Abraham and said, your descendants, which had, were not yet, uh, but those of the sons of Jacob that would travel into Egypt and be in bondage there, which God foretold that they would go in, they would be there in the fourth generation, they would come out richer than they went in. And it's important to understand that these people oppressed the people of God who, please do not make the mistake for some of you new people listening to think that the people that went into Egypt's bondage were Jews. They were not Jews. I encounter this almost every time I have a conversation with somebody. Abraham was not a Jew. Moses was not a Jew. The word Jew only began to be used when the kingdoms divided after the death of Solomon. We're talking about in about 920, 930, when the kingdoms divided, and those people who were part of Judah, the Judahites, that's where the word is first applied, those people, the Judahites, which we have Anglicized as Jews and Jewry, previously was not used. When people talk about, the Jews love to say, Abraham is ours and Moses is ours. And that may be true, but guess what? The Christians claim too, and Muslims as well. And that's because, if you read carefully, there were Hebrews, but there were no Jews until the division, the dividing of the kingdoms. And what we have in successive waves are kingdoms that oppressed God's people. Sometimes God let those kingdoms oppress God chose certain kingdoms to oppress. Uh, Egypt is one of them. And you might say, well, that's pretty cool of God. But listen, this is the reason why I'm looking at prophecy this way. If God declared to Abraham, that to Abram then, that descendants of his was, were going to go into Egypt and they were going to go in, stay there for four generations and come out and come out richer. And then you read the opening of Exodus where it says, after all the greatness that happened in the close of the book of Genesis with Joseph essentially saving his people and they all come down to Egypt. How did they manage to all come down to Egypt? How did they all get there? Sons, 70 sons it says, although there's more than that, 70 souls, sons of Israel. And then it says there rose up a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. Are you kidding me? If, if Joseph was that famous and he saved the people, how could there be a Pharaoh that rose up that knew not Joseph? Joseph, who saved the people. And then, of course, you've got to go back to look at the lines of the Pharaohs to understand, yes, that's very tenable, especially if it was a child ruler, which was uh, a very common practice in Egypt. And what I'm saying to you is that God used the Egyptians to oppress his people. And they came out, and victory was had, and then another people rose up. Now, you know, there's, there's people in between. There's the Parasites, the Hittites, the Jebusites. So don't talk to me about going into the Promised Land and making that a type of heaven. Because if, if I get to heaven and there's Parasites, Jebusites, and all kinds of sites there, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> I made a detour somewhere, and it, it, it sure, certainly wasn't heaven. But the people that, again, in successive waves, oppress and bring false religion I just mentioned Nimrod back there and his wife Samirmus and the birth of their son Tammuz, which she claimed was from the sun. 
and you've got mother and child worship that begins to be propagated. Don't think about Jesus in the hands of the Virgin Mary. Forget that's, just push that aside for a minute. Centuries before, mother and child worship. I collect things, uh, antiquities from Egypt, and you'll be surprised at how many uh, artwork depictions of mother and child were already there. We're talking about things that go back to uh, 2000, 2500 BC, mother and child worship. It's a very common thing and became the type, the symbolism that then eventually as time goes on is grafted on to our worship and we suddenly equate the worship of mother and child, which is another corruption. But in waves of things, false religion is tacked on and at some point the lines get blurred. It's hard to know if you don't study this book, it's hard to know what is true and what is not. And from the Assyrians, we go to the Babylonians, and they bring on some of the uh, fiercest oppression on God's people, the final carrying away into captivity. For the Assyrians and the Babylonians took away the north and the south so that these were finally taken away, carried off. Well, the people that are professed to be the lost tribes of Israel, which are not lost, which are dispersed, which I won't talk about today, and those people who were carried into Babylonian captivity that was foretold by the prophet Jeremiah. Daniel's reading the book. He sees that Jeremiah foretold of the 70 years. All of what I'm saying to you at the time that it, it was spoken was prophetic and through our Bible came to pass. We're reading it now as history. But without the understanding of successive waves of kingdoms oppressing God's people, and in these successive waves, there has always been false religion. And each time the wave comes, it takes over. It, it's almost like diluting something a little bit more each time. So if you were looking at the children of Israel, if you were looking at the worship that they once had as Invasions come as they are carried away. Everything is watered down. Even when the edict is given for these people to return through the mouth of Cyrus, the heathen king, which we just studied, the book of Nehemiah and Ezra record the return of the people to rebuild the city and the temple, the walls. Very few people returned. Out of the mass multitude of people who were carried away into captivity, very few people returned. Now, God used, as I said, and continued to use after the Babylonians, we have another wave of people who will oppress God's people. Those are the Medo-Persian people. Then from that same territory, an expansion of that territory will be the Grecian Empire, which was led by Alexander the Great and his conquering and his desire to acquire and conquer as much as possible. And finally, to the kingdom, which is the Roman Empire, and if one studies the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, you can see how over time there was oppression of God's people until the time of Constantine when Christianity, we're talking about a huge span of time now, to where Christianity is then accepted and tolerated with the Edict of Milan in 313, an edict of toleration to tolerate Christian worship, and Christians ceased to be persecuted for a time, and then there was peace, and then there was more persecution. And each one of these brought a new wave of persecution upon God's people and their brand of putting on, stamping on, grafting on to the practices. If you can find the fundamental root, pagan worship. So when people come into the church and they say, well, what about this? I say... If you stick around here long enough, yeah, you might be a little bit angry at me at some point because I've, I've busted a couple of your, your great balloons you like to carry around and call your faith. But the reality is, and this is the reality, if you'll study this book with me, and I say with me, I'm going to stand here and preach for as long as I can, but if you'll study along with me and you'll be diligent to do your part, at some point you recognize that many things that you held as genuine to your faith, are nothing but Satan's crafty devices through the ages that have crept in to stamp 
another brand on. I mean, you know, I said this last week or two weeks ago about Christmas. I get very, very irritated at Christian programming. These are our pastors and teachers. Look at me, air quotes. Pastors and teachers saying, put Christ back in Christmas. What's wrong with you out there? Why put Christ back in Christmas? Well, that'd be great, except he was never in it. Now, let me go back to something I, I'm kind of deviating a little bit from my message, but I, you know, this is probably long overdue anyway. If we cannot start with the premise, let's go take a couple of steps back here. If we cannot start with the premise of God's set times, and God has set times for things. In his book, he has set feasts, he has set times. Even as I just described prophecy to you, he said in the fourth generation, that was a set time for those people to come out. Jeremiah had a set prophecy of the 70 years. There are more revelations of God's timing in the book of Daniel that tell about the 70 weeks of years, 69 of which have passed, and there's a gap of time in God's set time. The last seven weeks, years, will come to pass at the set time when God essentially pulls the switch and says, that's it, here we go. But before that can happen, other things in God's set time must occur. So when people talk about, let's go back to the virgin birth for a minute. And they say, well, that just couldn't be. How could, it's either widely accepted and perverted or rejected because it's so impossible. But if you understand the reality of why the virgin birth, why God had to do it this way, and it's per it makes perfect sense if you're going to study the lineage and if you're going to study the bloodline, if you're going to go through all of those things and the generations and how in God's set time did he work it out that this juncture of this line and this line coincide at the right point from Adam to Christ, making so many generations at the set point that this woman would give birth to Christ the Messiah. And it's impossible, right, to have virgin birth. Well, Christianity begins with the miracle, and if you're not ready to accept that, you're probably not ready to accept the rest of it, because the rest of it requires acceptance of certain miracle premise. Now, people have taken the virgin birth. You want to talk about corruption? And Mary suddenly became perpetual in her virginity. You ladies, try that on for size if you've had a child. <laughs> but there's an entire faith that's built upon that that venerates her perpetual virginity. And when we talk about this, these, some of these people are so devout in their worship. This is what is confounding. Very devout, but have never even opened up the book to see that Jesus himself rebuked those people that said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. And he said, who is my mother and who are my brethren? To his disciples and to the onlooking crowd, except those that do the will of of my father. He didn't elevate his mother. Come on. But you'd have to be in the book. So corruption again is grafted on. Then we talk about the, the birth of Jesus Christ. And I just started on this to say about Christmas and how people will get extremely religious around Christmas time. You know, the religious urge, contrary to what some people think, the religious urge, not spiritual, religious urge, I believe comes from the devil. The urge. And I say that because you'll notice at these holy days, people will come out and desire to be holy for a day. What does, what does holiness unto the Lord mean? It means you've been set apart. It doesn't mean you go into a monastery and you go hide out in a cloister. It means set apart by God. That means, Lord, watch out. You can do whatever you want with me. You can splat me. You can build me up. You can make me. You can tear me down. I'm yours. That's what holiness means. So when people talk about this idea of being religious, they've completely succumbed to the trappings of what I call this incredible lure to, at least for one day, once a year, well, you know, you'll yield to somebody wanting to steal that parking space during that one week but given any other week, man, you got fingers flying out your window, right? <laughs> and it's not to wave a greeting 
of Christian goodness, let me tell you. So when we talk about the birth of Christ, it's important to understand God has set times, and those set times have been laid out. If, as we read the New Testament, Paul says, Christ is our Passover, and we, we read the Gospels, and we understand a certain time. On the calendar at the time that Christ was born, in the year that Christ was born, Passover had to fall in the middle of the week. And contrary to what we have adopted, which we celebrate universally, people, you, know, you see them, they celebrate Good Friday. Well, the question is, if you're reading this book and Jesus said there'll be no other sign save the sign of Jonah, which is three days and three nights, and please you people who'd like to send me letters about it, it's only a day and a half and that's the way it happened. You are misguided in your reading. It's the reason why Jesus lifted the passage of Jonah up to say three days and three nights and read, go back and read Jonah and don't read it with a caricatured mind and you'll realize what Christ was saying there as Jonah cried out of the the great fish's belly as a cry from hell. That he was in the grave for 72 hours fulfilling the set time of God and he had to be in the tomb at a certain time and come out at a certain time which is the fulfillment of first fruits, unleavened bread. We talk about the atonement which Christ is our covering. The Jews had the Ark of the Covenant with the Kapareth, the covering. And as long as the one who was approved to approach and sprinkle the blood on the covering, representing the blood sprinkled for the entire congregation. But to, to look upon or to touch the Ark, and we would say it this way, as Christians, Christ is our covering. His shed blood accomplished what the book of the writer of Hebrews says, the blood of bulls and goats could not do, cleansing our dead conscience from, or cleansing our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So when we talk about God as setting dates, it's important as we look at prophecy to understand that there have been successive kingdoms that have come and oppressed God's people. And there have been graftings on over time of false religion, of false worship. And I, I'm just now referencing Easter, which people will get very uptight about because they want to go to sunrise service because they believe that Jesus came out of the tomb very early Sunday morning because they haven't even made the transition to the fact that when it says the first day of the week, the first day of the week for the Jews would have been Saturday Sundown, sometime after the Sabbath occurred, Friday night to Saturday after sundown, after that time. So sometime after the Sabbath was over, Saturday, sometime between that time and the morning. I don't know where we get the idea somehow. Everybody's got to get up at 4 o'clock to be out there for 5 o'clock for sunrise service. When the reality is if you're going to do something to commemorate, it'd probably be wise to have a service on Saturday night, sometime possibly around 7 p.m. maybe, somewhere around there. That, that would be more biblical. But we just take these things, and of course, listen, I came into the church full of all that tradition, yes, and full of other stuff too, but I came in, <laughs> I came in thinking I, I had all this down pat, right? I knew all of this. And I heard Dr. Scott preaching, and I thought, good grief, what on earth is this man doing? He's ruining everything for me. He's like, he's like the Grinch. And I went on a journey to start looking up all these things, and it came very, very clear. In fact, I've told you the story of sitting in, in his living room with him, and he, he was the one that first said to me, I challenge you to find Christmas in the Bible, in the New Testament. In other words, that's a good way, it was a good trick for him to say, hey, go read the Bible. But go. <laughs> and I couldn't find it, and I was just, I was stumped. And then, of course, we you know, opened up a conversation. I kept listening, and obviously, uh, at some point, it became clear to me, boy, you want to talk about being duped? There's a good one for you. Now, I don't, I don't hold any malice towards the institution that I came out of. I'm talking about a religious institution because I left it a long time ago. But God did not leave me, and God gave me the ability to be led to a place where I would hear sound Bible teaching, and God 
then did something else, which is to raise me up to be the perpetuator of that sound teaching. So if you're listening to me today and you're relatively new, I would advise you to do one thing. Keep listening, because at some point, you're going to do exactly what I did. You're going to take your Bible, and you're going to start reading. What she's saying, there's no Christmas. I'm going to find Christmas in here somewhere. Uh, I know it's there, until you'll, you'll turn every page, and you won't find it. And then you'll say, okay, well, there's got to be some other thing to this. And you'll realize that these are the issues we have to deal with. Do I believe in the nativity that Christ was born sometime in the fall, the first trumpet that was blown, another set time of God? Absolutely. And we'll talk about the return of Christ in the prophecy teaching because that's equally important. But what I want you to know here is that without an understanding of these basic principles, when you come to look at, especially where we've been focusing on Daniel and I'm trying to head into Revelation, it won't make any sense to, 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 why are we talking about these kingdoms that are gone? These kingdoms that in Daniel's day began with Babylon, Medo-Persia, to Grecia, to Rome, to something nondescript after Rome, the ten-toed kingdom, part iron, part clay, to the book of Revelation, which sees now slightly before um, Daniel's time, including Egypt and Assyria in its list of uh, oppressors of God's people. Without that knowledge, you're going to say, what does this have to do with anything? And then we spend all of last Sunday looking at the 11th chapter. And praise God, a few of you said, I now understand why it was so important. Because what's in the middle of the north and the south? Israel. Jerusalem specifically, which was the prophecy given to Daniel, thy people and thy holy city. If you forget and lose track of that, all this just becomes meaningless, a mass of meaningless mumbo-jumbo of dates and people, and who cares? So the big picture is to understand without these pieces, it makes no sense. And lastly, before I can even get into my message, I have to say this one last thing. I think there, over the course of the church, we have studied the Reformation, and even inside the Catholic Church, the Counter-Reformation, which some of those people actually did want to reform the Catholic Church. But if you study church history, and then you study the church in America, there have been several attempts to go back to some form of orthodoxy, which for the church, the Catholic Church, led to legalism. Even for the Protestant Church, unfortunately, the same thing happened. And a group of neo-orthodox theologians uh, sometime in the 1900s, and that didn't last very long because with the introduction of progressive education and with many other things that changed and the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of the educational system and the study of this book, which has basically become something archaic to most people, what you have, you must have something to replace this with. So you can go to a church where everybody walks in and has their Bible neatly tucked under their arm and they sit down and it goes somewhere underneath them and they might raise it up for just a few seconds while the pastor says, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and then that's it. And very easily, yes, and very easily. Did you like that one? And very easily, and very easily, humanism and psychology take over. We have to tell people how to solve their problems apart from God because teaching people about the promises of God and God's fidelity, this is why I, I decided to tackle prophecy because once you begin climbing the pilgrim's pathway on the promises of God and you realize God is there, he's real, he's with you, you begin to climb up the stairs of prophecy and you realize that if God has made good on all these things, he's going to be with me. He's not going to let me down. He's going to take me all the way. I just have to stay focused. A lot of these folks come in and they, they think, well, uh, they, they should talk about abortion. They should talk about homosexuality. What about that other bathroom problem? And, <laughs> you know, let me just tell you something. I'm going to say it again for the benefit of those people who, who don't understand. It is the... It is the eroding of sound biblical teaching that Timothy was warning of, that Paul warned of. There'll come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. People with itching ears, people who desire to have things said to them that are smooth and well-pleasing versus 
you know, this makes me uncomfortable. Or how about this? How many people have sat in this church and said, I don't understand what he or she is saying? How many have done that? I've done that. I don't understand. I don't get it. You know what that is? That's called an opportunity of faith for you to sit for another Sunday, another 10 Sundays, another 100. Maybe for the rest of your life, maybe God will be gracious. In the last day that you're here on earth, a light will go on. Oh, that's it. It all came together, <laughs> right? But humanism is the most dangerous thing to have penetrated the church. And don't think this is, this is new. I studied this as part of my studies on the Catholic Church and the father, I won't call him the father of humanism, but Moore's utopia painted the picture of, of what we could do um, to, to intervene. You've got people like Erasmus, the same thing, very humanistic mindset. And so don't think that that's an archaic problem because in the future, and we're seeing it now with our government and we're seeing it more and more with churches who forget that the mission of the church of Jesus Christ, Christ said, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my outcalled ones. And he didn't call out people from among other people so that you could go out and do other things apart from the first things first. Learn what's in this book. You want to go out and help people and do whatever? Do it because you want to do it. Don't think that it's going to get you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. Everything was done by Christ. If there's anything that you can claim you have done to merit getting in, you have, you have frustrated, you have wasted the complete sacrifice of Christ at Calvary and all that he did in shedding his blood for you and for me. So when I talk about the idea of humanism, don't think it's an old problem. It's an old problem that is still, it's still evolving and it will get progressively worse as the church reaches its end time. Now, why do I give all this as a, as a background? It only took me 30-some minutes to do this. But let me just say this to you. Part of the problem is that when we begin to study these set times, when we begin to look at, as I said, Daniel and Revelation, and we'll also need to look at Zechariah, Zephaniah, Micah, and Amos, um, we're going to see that when God says in many diverse places, the indignation, the wrath of God, the, the, Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble. There will be a time that God says, enough now. And that time is described as tribulation, the great tribulation, which encompasses the last of the 70 weeks of years in Daniel's prophecy. And I will have to teach on this because there's a lot of people who don't have that foundation. That's fine. But there is a final period of weeks, which we call the seven weeks of years in Daniel's prophecy that have not yet been fulfilled. And we talk about God setting times and dates. And we also, I've just referred to false religion, and I've referred to specifically things being grafted on, and the setup for humanism. That's all, it's all going to get larger and greater and more magnified as we approach those last seven years. In order for Antichrist to come to power, which we have been studying, believe it or not, in the book of Daniel. But in order for Antichrist to come to power, certain things must happen. And there's great confusion. I Believe me, I have every single commentary that you could possibly read. Some people believe he'll be, he'll be straight out of the uh, Islamic Muslim background. Others believe he'll be a Jew coming out of that territory. I believe that he's going to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. That's the way he's going to come to the table and be a peacemaker and bring everybody together and say, come on, let's make a deal. Let's have a peaceful deal. Revelation 6, as the Lamb is opening up the seals in heaven, the seals, by the way, that were closed by Daniel, Daniel 12. So I can start putting this, this mess together here. Daniel 12. Because we still have a lot of teaching out of Daniel to do, but I want to try and bring some things together today. Daniel 12 says, and at that time, what time? At that time, which takes us back to Daniel 11, verses 35b, all the way to 45. All the events that will happen in those verses, and there was no chapter and verse when this was written, 
At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of who? Thy people. So when people talk about Michael, sometimes referred to as the archangel, but Michael is the angel to who? Thy people, Daniel's people. Now we're talking about the Jews. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, jump down with me, because there's so much here that I'd like to treat, but limited time to do it. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Keep reading. Verse 9, he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And Daniel's prophecy closes with verse 13, But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. I can't wait to teach on that verse because that verse is like, when you see it aright, you'll say, Woo, if I, was, if, I, if I was Daniel and I was hearing this, instead of it being lost in translation somewhere, I'd be doing a hallelujah dance. But what's being said to Daniel is now you've been given this incredible information. Some of it was explained. Some of it was revealed. Oh, we haven't gotten to the ninth chapter, which tells of Messiah coming and Messiah being cut off. Really, I mean, if you talk about a man who received so much information from God about future events, but this last portion here regarding the last portion of the 11th chapter, which the 12th chapter opens with at that time, when the events of 1135b through 45 happen, at that time. Now look, it's not for you to know the rest of it. It's sealed up until the end. Oh, <laughs> what a letdown, right? Except here's what's amazing. God never leaves us without better information because the time of the end now is in the book of Revelation. So let's turn there. I've just butchered about 50 different messages. See, I've got, I've got all these notes and I decided, ah, who needs the notes, right? All right, put the notes aside. All right, let's do this in order a little bit. The opening, obviously, is John on the Isle of Patmos, exiled there for preaching God's word. He sees a vision of the Lord. He gets a message to write to the seven churches, which we will discuss. And I'll just say a footnote about these seven churches. These seven churches, if you can look at a map and understand where these churches might be, it makes no sense that if we're talking about the end of time and world events, uh, events that will happen in Jerusalem, but will also be world events, it makes no sense to talk about seven little tiny dots on the map, unless they also have a double meaning and represent something else, which we'll get to. Keep going. And now in the fourth chapter, you have John, who from writing these seven churches, now hears a voice like of a trumpet talking with him. Wah, 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 right? <laughs> no, that's the TV evangelist. C c come up hither, and I will show you the things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and beheld... Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And you've got this great description of worship of these people that are around the throne, 20 and 4 elders and 24 seats, 24 elders, 24 seats. They're all decked out. We've got this incredible worship going on. We've got beasts that are not evil beasts, but they're depictions of beasts, which living beings would be a better description, that are there at this worship. And I'm starting now in chapter 5 because I want to talk about the things that were sealed in Daniel's time. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. Now, if you don't think that God had his hand in all of this, that there's just some random thing of God likes books and seals, he's a stamp collector, he's a, <laughs> right? Uh, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man, you've got to read this carefully, no man in heaven, 
nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, David, uh, I'll read King James, but it's a poor translation, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. I want you to remember what John is seeing is the reality and everything else that will be seen that is the dupe, the the fraud, the corrupted version will be something that sounds like, that looks like, which is why the church world today even can be duped so easily. Why do you think when people hear healing ministry, miracle healing ministry, and people are falling down and, or what, they're rolling all over the place and people, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go to that service. You heard about the guy who was, this is many years ago, he was holding his services in Florida. And people were lining up and they had, you know, somebody's kid was, it's very tragic, the kid was bound in a wheelchair. I believe God heals, I just don't believe he heals that way. Doesn't, you don't need to have a circus spectacle show. God can heal you in the privacy of your own home. He can heal you in your car. He can heal you while you're sitting on the toilet. I don't believe that he needs the fanfare and the accolades. And by the way, this particular guy who was the healing minister, while they didn't know, they set up a hidden camera, and he was backstage getting high, having a couple of beers, and hitting up who knows what. So when he came out, he looked like he was in the spirit. People flock to that. Now listen, I don't condemn. I don't condemn because I, I know what it's like to be desperate. When you desperately, each of us has to make the journey, but we say, it's not my time. You, you look, if, if, if something comes to your door, if sickness comes to your door, if, if, if destitution robs you of all, you will get desperate and you will suddenly try every single handle. Some of you have been there. You'll try everything. So I don't condemn those people. But this, this is why I said the substitute, the, the grafting on that's been through the ages. Do I think that there have been some, some people who have received the gift of healing? I believe yes. But I believe for the most part, here's what I do believe. If God gave somebody the gift of healing, they would never make themselves a spectacle. They would not put themselves on display. Why? Because if it's a gift from God, it is to magnify God and bring glory to Jesus Christ, not to the individual. God didn't give gifts so that we might get full of pride and, oh, I'm famous now, come see me. Dr. Scott used to talk about the woman in her sackcloth dress. Uh, I can tell you about and rattle off all the names of different ministries just in my time. Just in my short period of being in the pulpit that I've seen where people say, oh, you've got to go see this person. Miracle worker. Oh, okay, that's great. Because the Antichrist and the false prophet, they're going to do some good ones too. And the way I understand it, they'll be so incredible and irrefutable. They'll be the real deal. A lot of what goes on down here is fake. This, these will be real bona fide miracles. This is why the Bible says if we're possible, even the very elect will be deceived. That's why I tell you, you've got to study this book And don't make one verse of scripture the whole thing that you start marching into town with telling people that's that. But here we can see what he's seeing. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints." I want you to remember that the next time you sit down at any point or you stand to pray, remember where your prayers go. They're not just evaporating on empty ears, but here's an image of where they might actually be presented. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And it has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Remember, this is supposedly happening in heaven. And right here it says, and we shall reign on earth, which is a foretelling of what will happen at the end. Behold, I make all things new. And we're not just talking about the thousand years uh, millennial. We're talking about, behold, I make all things new, shall reign on earth. 
Supposedly, this is all happening in heaven, right? And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. It's a whole great multitude saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all them that are, that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. The four and twenty elders fell down, worship him that liveth forever and ever. Now here we go with the seals. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, you stop right there, and if you're relatively new here, if you're an old-timer, you've got all kinds of stuff in your Bible. If you're new here, you put down right beside there, Antichrist. That seal that was sealed up in Daniel's time, that he said it's not for you to know until the end of time or until the time of the end, here comes the beginning. But this man comes as a man of peace. Now, stay where you are. Forgive me, but stay where you are. And I'm going to read... Back there to confirm what I'm saying. This man who we just looked at, who sits on the white horse, he will come after Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. The prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war of desolations are determined. And he shall confirm... King James says, the covenant, it's a covenant, with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice. In the midst of the week, in the midst of that last seventh portion, the last seven weeks of years or the last seven years on earth, if you want to call it, say it like that, we now see this person, the Antichrist, breaking a covenant that he made, the peace plan bringing the north and the south, bringing everybody together. I'm telling you, this will be a piece of cake. If you look at what really is going on in the Middle East, we definitely need someone who will be able to talk to the most radicalized uh, religion that's planted in the Middle East that's now taking over Libya. And we'll need someone who will be able to talk to the Jews and who will be a little... You see, you understand why I say this is... You've got to have a little bit of... We know the territory out of where this man will come. But in order to bring everybody to the table, he'll have to represent a little bit of everything, which means nothing. But to show you why I said be careful about these people who don't study and they, they, they will take things and twist them, we have the picture of Christ who comes on a white horse. That's back there a little further on in Revelation 19 when John says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself, clothed, clothed in vesture, a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Here we have Jesus Christ. Verse 16, if you read, on, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have the Lord Jesus Christ coming on a white horse with his armies, his armies, his heavenly riders behind him. What I'm trying to tell you is there's always been the capacity for people even to read this and put these two passages together. I've heard people say, well, undoubtedly what happens in Revelation 6 right there, that's that's, that's Jesus Christ. Well, let me just ask him. The lamb is in heaven. Is he going to let himself out? Never mind. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's people who read this and they get confused. There's people who read this and they don't quite understand. But there's also people who read this and see that Satan and the demonic powers that be, there's always something that will be grafted on to confuse people. So this man will come on the stage of history, the one in Revelation 6, and he will come as a man of peace. You see, he has no arrow. 
And it says going forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer. He'll have no arrow. That last portion of what we're talking about, the last, we'll call it the last seven weeks or of the 70 weeks, 69 that have been accomplished and the one that remains, a window of time must pass until this man of peace breaks the covenant. And we call that period the three and a half years. And we'll discuss the, the places where it talks about 42 months and time that's given. But halfway in the middle of the week, that means three and a half years in, this man of peace breaks the peace treaty. And the demon that inhabited Alexander the Great will then possess this man and the demons that are unleashed will make this man and everything that happens on earth, it will be like, as was described both in Daniel and other places, such as was never seen before. The type of, Daniel 12 I just read from, never seen before, the type of things that would be poured out on the earth. Now the first question that people ask is why? Why must God do this? And why must it happen this way? And the first thing I'm going to tell you is because God declared it in his word. I'm not here to give you my opinion. If it was me and I was God, I would have wiped the world out a long time ago and just settled the problem, solved it a long time ago. <laughs> Thank God I'm not God and God's got a plan, which if you read carefully, you'll find out that the wrath that is poured out is a combination of things. We've, we have to talk about eventually the Jews and the bringing together of two factions, if you will, uh, to become one, which is what the book of Ezekiel talks about, reuniting uh, two parts of Israel that must become one before this takes place. We've got a lot of different things that must happen. God will reconcile his people to himself and will bring them to a place, which is what Zechariah talks about. When Christ returns and his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, changing the geographical territory, opening up that space and creating a place where water may flow, which will be the water that flows from out of the temple that Ezekiel spoke of, good grief, here I go again, I've got 50 other messages going. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that in this depiction, we have in Zechariah's book, it says they'll look upon him whom they've pierced and they'll mourn. There will, there will be people that will recognize this indeed is the Messiah. We missed the boat. We did this to him. And there'll be other people that refuse to acknowledge both Jew and Gentile this is the wrath of God that will be poured out on the earth. Now, there's the wrath of God, which is what we've often read through the Old Testament, which is the punishment of those people who refuse to turn back to God. But if you read carefully, you must distinguish between punishment upon God's people, as in the time that was prophesied by Jeremiah, and the ultimate punishment, which the New Testament calls tribulation, the great tribulation. All of that must be accomplished. Then Christ will set up his millennial kingdom. We have to have first the, the battle of Armageddon, the millennial kingdom, which will be set up, the last battle, which will be by a very stout area, geographical area, which is known to refuse religion anyway, the territories of Russia and China. The last chapter in God's book of the people of the earth will not be a nuclear holocaust. It'll be God blotting out the last after the millennial kingdom is set up and we've got Russia and China coming down, God is going to wipe those people out who have not repented. Will there be preachers of righteousness during this whole time? Absolutely. The 144,000, which we'll talk about. I'm doing like an overview and a mixing pot of things. We'll have two witnesses who come to preach, who will come preaching and proclaiming the gospel message, who will be actually killed and they'll lay in the street for a couple of days, three and a half days, and they'll be resurrected. The whole world will see that. If you saw that, you might become a believer too. Uh, so there's going to be a whole bunch of things going on, but the bottom line is that God has to put an end to the evil on earth. And bringing another flood, he said, I'll never flood the earth again. That won't fix it. I sent my only begotten son to pay the price, but that still didn't fix it. So we read from Isaiah and Peter, two things that we can glean. God will send a fervent heat that will essentially melt after all of these things have taken place, that will essentially melt away everything that is. That could be the, the, um, the nuclear thing that people talk about. But all I'm telling you is that it then says, God says, behold, I make all things new, a new heaven and a new earth. And that place where we will rule and reign will be in the recreated earth. 
And if you think all of that's just way out there, far nutty, I could tell you a lot more nuttier things. But I've got good Bible to back this up. And the reality is when I tell you, you know, people come in and they think, okay, heaven. I've heard people talk about heaven and how they think heaven is some type of holding pen. And if you've come out of the Catholic tradition, you know that, you know, purgatory is taught. And you, you're taught that you're, you're there until somebody can either pay you out of there or they can pray you out of there, which sounds, by the way, like religious Christian television. But what I'm trying to say is that none of these things are games with God. And he gave this revelation very crystal clear to Daniel. The details that he gave that we have still yet to study must be opened up to really understand the scope and magnitude of precision of the things that from Daniel's perspective, how could he know? Even if you gave license and said he wrote it later than he did, how could he know about Messiah being cut off but not for himself? We could talk about Messiah coming, but how would he know not for himself? And how would he know that there'd be one that would come after him that would bring the desolation into the sanctuary and do these things that we know the Antichrist will do? So there is a purpose for doing all this. Yes, I want everybody to know. I want your, your pages to be marked up. There's no crime in marking up the pages and taking notes and putting them somewhere where you can actually read them. But the point is for you to be able to open up this book and understand everything in here fills a need and purpose for the child of God. And for me, yes, we need to revisit some of the promises for other things, but the promise of God basically saying, I'm going to take care of this old earth and I'm going to take care of those who wouldn't hear. I'm going to pour out my wrath where it needs to be poured out. And for the people that are mine, those that are mine, the church that has been called out, you're his loved ones. We're not talking about you as subject to wrath. The Thessalonians says the church is not appointed unto wrath. We're talking about those people who refuse. And we're not just talking about refusing in the sense of, oh, I don't want to do that or I don't want to hear about it. We're talking about people who have had the ability to sit somewhere, hear the preached word, and refuse and reject. We're talking about people who have stayed steeped in their traditions, who refuse to open up this book and say, this is that, not the thing which makes void the word of God. So for me, I think this is a great, uh, I've just leveled the field and tried to bring some things together. We still need to talk about the Antichrist in great detail, his territory, the beast, the false prophet. We've got so many things to pick apart here that we're going to need much more time. I don't have it today, so I hope you'll come back next time. That's my message. <laughs> come on up. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.